Welcome to Crucifying Addiction. My name is Trent. I'm your co-host. Bailey just started college. He left town this past weekend and is now in Waco, Texas. And for the time being, uh, we're excited to be doing some independent material and calling in remotely. It's going to be exciting stuff. Right now, you're about to listen to my testimony. This is our very first recording from back in like March of 2023. And I'm giving you this disclaimer because the audio quality isn't as good as our other recordings. There was a lot of trial and error in the beginning, but I hope this blesses you. Like, subscribe, leave comments, share it with somebody, and ask questions. We're looking at that stuff, and we'd love to address anything that we missed through our journey in addiction in Christ. With all that being said, enjoy. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You know, in this verse first spoke to me through uh, a book With your uh, host, Bailey Jowers, and your other host, Trent Mulkey. All right, man. So how, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm 27. Um, live in San Angelo, Texas. Go to Celebration Church currently. I'm married with two dogs. And uh, I currently work as a competency training development specialist at... San Angelo State Support Living Center, which is one of the uh, state of Texas's forensic units. Sweet, man. Sounds like pretty fun. It's interesting. Nice. So what exactly do you do as there? Most of the teaching is to new employee orientation. We cover uh, intellectual disabilities, um, understanding uh, aggression, and trauma-informed care and then we also teach physical restraints how to restrain an individual an adult individual who's aggressive um, as well as just kind of keep yourself from getting hurt in the process and then the normal day-to-day job duties of somebody working at the facility but uh, we also um, are a resource for aging and protective services kind of like CPS um, APS will look for uh, the training information on an employee who may have um, been involved in a case and we provide that documentation which we would have administered the training for generally alright so the the, tra- the training that you do uh, the stuff you teach d- does this uh, like ever help you with your day to day life yeah yeah um I think when it comes to people with intellectual disabilities, I can totally relate. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's, a, I've seen, you know, some people maybe walking around picking up cigarette butts to get that last bit of tobacco. And I'm like, I wouldn't be too far from that. Uh, but also I think as a, as a public speaker, um, you know, we, we both go to school with ministry. Uh, we've had to, you know, even as a class, practice preaching in front of other people. But I think uh, my job uh, position has helped me speak dynamically um, to the listeners. And and that applies in, uh, there's a lot of times where I'm speaking in front of people more often than I ever thought I really would. Uh, and it just seems to be more and more of a thing. And so... Um, I'm definitely gaining skills in my current job position. In fact, in April, I'm going to Austin for uh, a professional trainer certification, which is going to uh, really put my teaching and public speaking abilities under some pressure. So, improvement it can only go up from here. Man, dude, that's really cool. That's really cool. I'm, gl- I'm glad, you, uh, glad you like that. Enjoy it. So, I... 
where where did this all kind of start for you, like addiction? Where did this start? Oh, uh, I would say it started from the very beginning. I would like to think that um, I was born with something missing at birth, like this emptiness. Now, of course, I don't remember when I was born. <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> but as early as I can remember, I was dissatisfied. I can relate to being irritable, restless, or discontent. I could be having the time of my life on a roller coaster on my birthday with all my best friends, and I got everything I asked for. And at the end of the day, I lay my head down and I just feel alone. Mm. And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with addiction? You know, and we all start somewhere and we all came out naked. Every single one of us. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I recognize um, that whole today as a spiritual malady, but at the time, there I thought something was wrong with me. You know, I wasn't okay with you, I wasn't okay with me, and I wasn't okay with tomorrow, and I wasn't okay with yesterday, and I was just not okay inside of this skin. Uh, And I've noticed, you know, a lot of people relate to that. The thing is, this hole that I felt inside of me, um, what does change, what does kind of differentiate people is what best fills that hole in a worldly sense okay? yeah and and funny thing is you know I hopefully when we get to the end of this we come full circle with that hole again you know we all have this hole as mm-hmm. a human we all have it yeah and we all end up going different ways and filling that hole but once we have found a complete fullness we all have the same thing sustaining that hole. The thing that belongs there. Yeah. Amen. But uh, for me, it was really, I like to say I'm an alcoholic. I got that from a good friend of mine, Chris Hopper. I remember a, year, a few years ago he said that and that stuck with me. I was like, I love that guy. I'm an alcoholic, man. Yeah, Chris Hopper's the bomb. Uh, I remember being like six years old and I would like my aunts and maybe my grandma, not my grandma, my aunts and uncles would smoke cigarettes on the front porch. And I remember like they would light one up and I would show them disgust and, and, and I would rebuke it. I pinch my nose and walk away and be like, ew, that smells disgusting. Cigarettes are bad for you. And, you know, so I guess I had a pretty sheltered life growing up for me to even kind of like have these opinions already set i remember dare program the cops you know would come to school and do a little q a and kind of show us what a taser is and also tell us (laughs) drugs are bad and i believed it i was like drugs are bad i tell people that i grew up mother's day out i grew up going to church all the time you know, I also grew up with music. I got my first guitar when I was eight. Uh, but that none of that stuff has anything to do with the fact that I was missing something. I was missing something. Well, I don't quite know why and what the situation was, but I decided. I got curious. So I decided I'm gonna try cigarettes. And I'd, we'd steal one out of my aunt's pack. She left on the front porch when they'd all go inside. We'd take them. Uh, me and my cousins, we would take turns taking them. We'd collect them. <laughs> they would, and they would never ask because they knew it was us taking them. And then it'd be the same with beer, you know. And none of that, that didn't tip me over the edge. I don't think tasting alcohol um, does it for a first time. Now today, I mean, there's no... There's no space where I'm tasting alcohol, but uh, I was not in it. Um, I wasn't stuck at this point, but I was just trying things because uh, these things 
it seemed to touch that emptiness that I felt inside of me in a way, you know, and as I got older, uh, relationships, sex, food, which is, you know, gluttony, Mm -hmm. um, drugs and alcohol, anything outside of myself, man, everything the world has to offer, offers with that and advertises that appeal of making you feel better, making you feel complete. And they're all talking about that same thing. It's that hole. Yeah. You're trying to fill it. Mm -hmm. They're saying this will solve your problem. And, uh, so I started to buy into that crap, man. (laughs) I did. I mean, like anybody else does, you know, like I had the, uh, excuse, I'm just a kid, you know, having fun, um, going into high school. I, uh, started to <clears throat> try marijuana. And remember, I was sticking my nose up at things, and I was saying drugs are bad. But as I as I crossed my own morals, as I broke my own rules, I began to disregard those rules. And those were my first consequences. My first consequences were spiritual consequences. You know, integrity. Uh, honesty. Of course, I can't go about my life without lying starting to lie. No, mom, I wasn't smoking a cigarette. I smell like cigarettes because uh, your sister smokes, right? Like, it's y'all's fault that I smell <laughs> like cigarettes. But I was smoking cigarettes, right? So I'm, I'm being dishonest. Um, and then we get into, you know, high school ends. Drinking starts happening. I remember my first drunk party. Man, I got drunk. My first party. I didn't just start to feel woozy and get sick and be like, okay, I'm done. Oof, I need to go home. Man, I had already, a week or so in advance, made up my mind. I'm going to drink as much as I can. And I didn't have this conscious anger or resentment that I, that I was aware of where it's like, I just want to get drunk. I just, I just made it a mission. I was like, I'm done taking sips. I want to see what it's like. Because I would start to feel the effects if maybe, you know, I got a hold of a beer every once in a while. But I wanted to know what it was really like because I would see people drunk. I saw pe- members of my family get drunk and they just seem carefree or they just seem so in touch with their emotions or, or they start to be more honest or they just seem super, you know, and... So, I got drunk for the first time, and I made it, I was an embarrassing mess. I'm a freshman at this party, I get drunk, and I throw up on myself on the couch. I remember somebody, like, had to, like, put me in a shower. First time getting drunk, man. And I took it all the way. But I remember the next morning, and I didn't feel... Oh, it was so embarrassing. I didn't think anything like that. I thought, man, that was so great. What did I think was so great? That green zone. Where I'm okay with you. I'm okay with me. I'm okay with tomorrow. And I'm okay with yesterday. And I'm okay in my skin. What happened? That hole was filled, dude. For a brief moment. That emptiness that nothing would take care of, man. I got drunk and I felt it. And so I continued to drink that night because it was good. It was good. Alcohol is not and was not my problem. Alcohol was my solution. And I figured that out that first night. This is going to solve my problems. You know, I am in recovery and I I hear a lot of stories, other people's lives and how they got in touch with it. And I've I've heard gradual alcoholics and people not getting drunk or not becoming alcoholic. I'm using quotation marks if you can't see. (laughs) Not not becoming alcoholic until they're in their like, you know, thirties and forties. I've even met people like not until they retire and then they all of a sudden have a problem. It's not my story, but I do know even today 
in sobriety, it's so easy for me to start to to use work and to use like that pursuit of money, um, to use lust, uh, some outside gratification, food still. Guilty of food sometimes, man. Like, you ever heard of eating your feelings? Like, I do that sometimes, you know? It's a real thing. And and it's a pickup put down. And I wouldn't say I have an addiction uh, to any of those things, but I have used them as a solution when I have the solution today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, going through all that, did you continue doing all that despite all those consequences? The answer is yes. Short, short, <laughs> shortly, it's yes. Yes, I did. Um, it's it's kind of a general pattern with addiction is that consequences don't really change anything. You know, somebody who maybe doesn't have an addiction, let's say an addiction for speeding, somebody doesn't have it. If they get pulled over, going ridiculously fast, and they get a speeding ticket. You know, the most sane, normal thought is if I don't speed like that anymore, I won't get a ticket again. But for somebody like me, and I'm super antisocial, that's not asocial. Asocial is I don't want to be around people, right? Antisocial is against society. If I get pulled over for speeding, my, my first thoughts don't go to if I stop speeding, I'll stop getting speeding tickets. No, my first thought is, I'm going to take a different way to work next time. <laughs> I'm going to figure out when this cop is off. I'm going to figure out his work rotation. And be sure to mark those days as I can go as fast as I want on those days. I might have to get a different job. So I don't have to go that way to work anymore. Whatever the case is, um, I did not especially in my addiction I did not take responsibility for my actions so consequences weren't my fault people were bringing consequences to me and it just made me upset and more uh, more irritable restless and discontent with the world around me I get caught by my parents get grounded Ugh, my parents suck alright I get suspended from school. Stupid teachers. Not saying, oh man, I put myself in a position to do these things, to get these consequences. So, consequences that drinking brought me, well, I remember one time in high school, uh, getting I, I got drunk and somebody put cocaine on the table. And I realized, I, I figured out quickly very quickly that cocaine will sober you right back up. And I could get drunk all over again. That's what it felt like. I was like, ah, a fresh restart without having to pass out and wake up the next day. Um, it was short-lived. It was dangerous. It caused a lot of problems. And, and not to mention like the emotional issues. You know, I had a girlfriend at the time and the distance that I put between us, even friends, if, if, if they weren't associated with my drinking, then they were in my way. Same thing goes for my parents and my sisters, my two younger sisters. They, they stood in the way of me and using things to fill this hole inside of me. Uh, and every time I tripped up over them, there was a consequence. And despite those consequences, I did continue to use. Um, I I was 17 the first time I went to jail. And uh, I remember picking up the phone and calling my dad and mom from the holding cell every five minutes from like 11 p.m. or midnight all the way until about 4 o'clock in the morning when they finally answered. And... <laughs> that's crazy I remember my dad was so mad and they gave talks about 
never bailing me out again. It's not that um, I didn't go, yes, sir, no, sir. Yeah, I know it was bad. I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop smoking weed. I'm going to put it down. It was just once, whatever it was, like I was spitting lies out of my mouth and you got me alone or got me with somebody who I'm still drinking with. And it's like, dude, that stupid cop, you know? So the continued use, the continued behavior was because the consequences weren't my own. I didn't have I didn't have a sense of responsibility over those consequences. I didn't feel like what I did is why I got those consequences. And now I do understand that sounds insane to some people. I'm sure if I played this over and listened to it, I'm like, man, if my older self could have heard that, my younger self could have heard that. It's like, duh, dude, you're the one with the weed. You're the one speeding. You're the one enacting that behavior. Well, the whole time you were trying to fill up that hole. And that's why, man, it was a fear. If I take, if I take responsibility for these consequences, then what am I going to do? What am I going to do? How am I going to fill that hole? Because I'll tell you, once you once you find a solution to that emptiness, a lot of people would agree they'd rather be dead than to go back living there with no solution in. Like, I could not imagine life without alcohol. And that was some wild thought to have, especially as like a 16, 17 year old kid thinking I already know what life is all about. And I could not imagine life without alcohol. And these are things that I came up with on my own. These ideas, these thoughts, they were mine. And nobody could take those away from me. So sure enough, my parents couldn't get me sober. Teachers the counselors, the jails, rehab didn't get me sober. Um, list goes on, broken hearts and relationships, car accidents. Those things didn't keep me sober. So during this time, were, were those times you wanted to get sober or was those times other people wanted you to get sober? No, so I never tried stopping at any of these times. Um, one one highlighted point in my life I think about is when my senior year, um, early in that senior year, I was at the back of the school, almost through a bottle of vodka, and there were a lot of things going on. Like, I had this girlfriend who, like, my parents actually let live with us. What? Yes. Don't get me started, man. <laughs> like, I'm like, hallelujah at the time, but now I'm just like, man, mom. What were you doing? Y'all just gave up on me, right? <laughs> <laughs> for real, for real. Uh, but she, they, she went off to join the military, but she was coming right back. And I called a recruiter, and they were like, uh, "At this stage of boot camp, she's coming back. It's probably one of three reasons: she's either pregnant, she failed her drug test. Both of those would be my fault, or." Or she fa she failed her mental psyche though, because it was early, right? I mean, like the chance they were saying she didn't break a bone or something like that. There's a low chance of that. So I'm sitting with that on my on my shoulders. Like I can't get a hold of her because she's still in boot camp. Oh man! And every time she calls, she calls my mom because I don't answer because I'm too busy doing my own thing. But I know she's coming back, and I feel like, man, I, I don't know what lies to say. I don't know what to keep up with when she gets back. I don't even want that responsibility if she's I – don't, I don't want her anymore is, is kind of how it was. And, and that's really sad for me to kind of say even today because, like, I, I really don't want to think that I felt that way. But in the middle of me and my selfishness, man, nobody else mattered. 
But I remember calling my mom that day. And I said, Mom, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but I said, Mom, everything around me is causing me problems. I need to go somewhere else. I need change. This was one of my first reaching out desperately for change. Unfortunately, I wasn't trying to stop drinking it. I wouldn't say that to anybody yet. But it started to become a thought. And that made things worse. Thinking that maybe like drinking is a problem. That made things worse. The whole time you were you were saying that everybody else was the problem. That drinking wasn't the problem. Right. It was your solution. Right. And then now you're <laughs> starting to realize it is the problem. Ah. Oh. Realize is a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I didn't want it because that would make it real if I realized, you know, like, mm-hmm. man, dude, I just was so terrified. You know, just a quick story, like, I would say a couple of months before that moment where I called my mom, um, my girlfriend who hadn't left for the military yet, her and her little sister, um, well, they were with me and we were at a friend's house and we were having a party. Just, it was, they called it, uh, man, down in South Texas, I was in Harlingen, Texas. What did they call it? Dude, it's not a party. <laughs> it's a small, a throwback. A get together? No, dude, it was, I had never heard of it before. A redneck get together. <sighs> <laughs> it was a small social gathering and uh, I remember my friend brought out a shotgun and I'm a boy scout and I was like super I took some pride in taking the gun from him and telling him dude you're crazy (laughs) okay alcohol and guns don't mix like I can imagine myself saying that I'm not sure what I said to him but I remember being mad taking the gun and cocking it and throwing shells out of the gun and I did that until no more shells came out I was wasted oh man uh you know I look at it today and as much as I thought I knew I had no idea that there would still be one in the barrel like it's not like a pistol you know, you, you throw it back until all of the bullets come out, and that's all the bullets. But a shell is loaded in, and it's loaded in. Yeah. I thought that gun was unloaded. And you know what I did after I unloaded it? All pissed off that he brought a gun out? I started to play with it. And it feels like I went hours holding it and walking around, but I bet you it was minutes. I remember standing beside my girlfriend at the time and I lowered the gun from one hand and let it lay in both hands. And I remember wrapping my finger around the trigger and pulling it. And it stopped the party. I mean, this was a home defense round 12 gauge tactical shotgun. And... I put a hole in the front door. It was aiming right at the front door. And I, for years, I woke up in cold sweats imagining if it was six inches to the left, it would have taken off my girlfriend's little sister's head. Oh, man. She was standing right there beside the hole. And that that image is burned, is burned into me. It's a scar that you can't see that I have to look at. Thank God I didn't kill anybody. And I wish I could say that that was the last time I played with guns drunk. But it wasn't. Um, That was just... So going back to the change. So I move across state to my grandmother's. Eight hours away. The next day, this was a Tuesday afternoon, I know it very well. Tuesday afternoon, I called my mom. 
girlfriend's coming back from baby. Like, I mean, she might be pregnant, you know, <laughs> like, uh, and I don't have a drinking problem, but I do maybe. And, um, I need to just go like, like I need a fresh start. I'm an army brat. Both of my parents met in the military and I'd moved around so much that moving felt like an easy way to reset. I'd already experienced it so much. And so that was what I said. I need to move. I want to go live with Bama. That's what I call my grandmother. Bama. And Wednesday, I was enrolled eight hours away. I immediately left. I was not... I had nothing to to finish. It wasn't... Let me tell all my friends why. I didn't have any more friends. It wasn't... You know, let me finish or get my homework that I have from my classes. You know, it was done. I cut off everything because I I was desperate to prove that alcohol wasn't my problem. If I take everything else out and I don't have any problems, then something over there was the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I move... Brownsboro High School is where I went to high school. I hope nobody from Brownsboro hears this, <laughs> which shouldn't be hard. There was a hundred in the graduating class, but it got worse, man. And here's the truth I came to with this move. This is why this was so highlighted in my life because once everything else, once I did that reset, I was the common denominator of all my problems. So once problems started popping up, it's like, man, that issue with that chick, I had that same issue with another chick down in Harlingen. What's going on? Well, I, I ran out of excuses. I ran out of those cards. You know, in Texas, you get a speeding ticket, you get to pull a card out. It's called defensive driving. Bam. Bam. <laughs> not on my record reverse reverse it's that reverse <laughs> card right and you only get to pull it out once every 12 months from the time of that speeding ticket i was getting like a speeding ticket every week bro and my record was piling up not a real speeding ticket like <laughs> the consequences and there were no more cards i was running out of excuses even the I'm 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 still eight I'm eighteen and living my best life right now. Let me. I couldn't even use that card without feeling guilty anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, you started to uh, build up that conscious of something's wrong, mm -hmm. and it's not the people around me. Yeah, yeah. And you know, if there were no consequences for my drinking, I'd still be drinking. It's it. I I, I don't have to elaborate any more than that I don't it's just that simple for me that whole I started to get angry at it mm. it was like a black hole it's like why can't you take that weekend drunk and let me get through the whole week I could not go a day without needing to fill it with something and alcohol started to be a little insufficient for me man not that it wouldn't work, but it was so much fluid. I would have to drink a whole half gallon of some cheap vodka to just be okay. And that was just a lot of work. And I wanted instant gratification. Mm -hmm. So I started saying yes to some other stuff. That hole. I noticed I wasn't filling the hole. I was like covering it up. You know, it would numb it. It was just this numbing. And I I was still filling myself with things inside of me. Uh but anyway, man, I went to jail a few more times. Um I should be a felon. I did go to jail for felonies, but with a good lawyer I'm not <laughs> um, stopping I found to be impossible but every time I would try to stop man I would start again like it's almost like I had a problem I had a problem 
with starting more than was stopping. I mean, I'd pass out drunk. I stopped. I literally am unconscious. I stopped drinking. The next day, I start again. So how do I stop starting? Where was God in all of this? Uh, if you asked me that at the time, I'd say way off in the distance. As far away from me as possible. You know, I thought, I don't know, I had my, nothing was biblical, man. I just had my thoughts and and how my dad would, how my dad would be with it, you know. He would disown me if he knew some of the stuff that I did at the time. I mean, he's, things are different now, but I um, was at a loss of identity. I wouldn't be my, I didn't want to be his son. I looked up to my dad. My dad was, is, is, my dad is a great man. And uh, I just couldn't associate, you know. I did, I grew up in church. I was, I said that earlier and, um, church and music went hand in hand with me and, uh, I played on the worship team. I remember having these like on fire moments at like, you know, church camp or vacation Bible school. I love church camp. <laughs> church camp's like one of the like greatest weeks ever, you know, you, yeah. you get to learn about God, you get to play all these fun games while doing it, like, right. tons of great memories, yeah, t- I told tons you. of weird ones too, but tons <laughs> of great ones, like, I remember, sorry, I remember one time, I drank mud, don't ask me why, I drank mud, okay, but, great times, great times, <laughs> <laughs> you drank mud, <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's, it's not a long story whatsoever. Our team needed points, and in order to get points for our team, mm-hmm. we had to do like weird things that nobody else would do. Mm. And there was a mud puddle outside, and I was like, hey, I'll drink some mud for some points. They're like, okay. Wow. Well, now I'm like immune to everything, I think. But <laughs> who knows? I might be able to relate. I mean... I'm sure you will, because if you ever drink San Angelo water, that's exactly what it tasted like, okay? <laughs> Guys, if you'll ever come to San Angelo, don't drink out of the hose. If yeah. you do, cool. You'll be immune to almost anything. Yep. But your COVID vaccine don't. <laughs> that is your COVID vaccine. <laughs> I took a swig of what I thought was like a, a beer in a can, and it turned out to be cigarette butts and dip. <laughs> but yeah b- back to the topic okay so <laughs> so vacation bible school man yeah i remember coming out of that being on fire and then i remember the school bell going off and i just went back to normal i didn't have a bad understanding of god growing up but i did not know what to do with shame and guilt. Um, why didn't, why didn't, you know, God or, uh, my parents get me to not even step into those spaces where I got to smoking and drinking? I don't know. Um, I just remember still feeling alone. You know, maybe, maybe I hadn't quite Maybe I didn't quite honestly grasp, you know, what, what Christ did on the cross and, and, and believe it and accept it. Um, I remember one of my first reactions to, to battling God inside of me was I told my parents, hey, uh, I think, not I think, I, I, didn't, I never said I think as a kid. <laughs> I always said I know. I say I think way more today. Well, dude, I mean, <laughs> we always think we know, right? <laughs> but we never know. No. We never know. No, I don't know nothing. The only person who knows is God. Mm. I mean, we, we we always think we know what we need, but really what we think we need isn't what we need. 
Mm. And we fill our life with those things we think we need, like drugs, alcohol, lust. Right. You know, trying to fill that hole. So there's this uh, there's this poem, and I'm not going to pull it up and try to read verbatim, but it's called Footprints in the Sand. Have you ever heard it? I think so. It's uh, this guy's telling this story um it's and he's the main character and he talks about uh i walked along the beach and the beach was his life and he dies and goes and goes to heaven right and he's looking down at the beach and he kind of he gets a moment to actually ask god that question you know everybody has something they want to ask god when they when they die well his was like god there were times in my life where you weren't there with me. You see in the beach, there's two sets of footprints. That's you walking with me, God. Me and God walking together down the beach. But then I remember these times where it's just my footprints, like right there. It's just my footprints. And that was a hard time in my life. And then you come back and there's two sets of footprints again. And there's another set of footprints that's all alone. And that was another hard time in my life. God, where were you doing? Where were you? And God replies, those times where there was one set of footprints, those are my footprints. And I was carrying you. That's great. And man, that rocked me when I first heard that and it was a few years ago I heard it and um footprints in the sand look it up it's really good put it on the wall put it on a t-shirt man get it tattooed <laughs> it's the truth uh and I so you know today if you ask me you know where was God in all this and the truth is he was there making sure I didn't kill myself I mean you're here now yeah. Yes, and that is a miracle. That is God. You know, um, it, it is a part of... It was hard for me for a while to say that I'm a miracle. <clears throat> but it's just the truth, you know. And, and, and nobody can really know how deep I got myself into um, but God. And... I'm not, people die every day in the same stuff that I was in, not stuff that wasn't even at near as, near as dangerous or, or near as risky or near as, um, flipping a coin, whether you make it through it or not, like, and they die every day. And I didn't, you know, and I really don't deserve it. I didn't do anything to deserve to still be breathing. Uh, so God was always there and I'll tell you God was right there when I was finally ready for a change yeah. when did you reconnect with him when did you reestablish that connection well I remember um, I was probably still young not, not far out of high school um, I st- stole my great grandmother's tennis bracelet and I was walking around this small town of Athens, Texas walking into pawn shops trying to sell it for the big bucks and the 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 morality of me that allowed my feet to continue moving was I have a couple of speeding tickets I need to pay off <laughs> dude I can't guarantee you that I was going to put any of that money towards a speeding ticket but that is what I lie. Like, I lie to myself, man. And um, I said, no, we're just, we need to do this to pay off these speeding tickets or there will be a warrant out for my arrest, right? So the funniest thing is, dude, I promise you, this was a real tennis bracelet. It was real diamonds and real gold. But for some reason, the pawn shops weren't taking it. And they say, like, sorry, we can't take this. 
it is so weird. I will tell you, I resorted to one of these like we buy gold places where they I let them pull the diamonds out of the bracelet to weigh the gold and they paid me for the gold. I I sold that bracelet for a very, very small fraction oh, man. of what it was actually even worth. But I needed to, you know, by this time, I can't even say I was consciously trying to fill this hole anymore. The thing is, every time I sobered up, every, every time I woke up, I was having to confront the shame and the guilt of everything I had done the last eight years. And I had not confronted a single one of those things yet. And I would have to get loaded. I would have to get so unable to feel for me to continue the day. So yeah, instead of $1,200, I'll take it for 200 because that's going to fix me right now. I had no interest in five minutes from now. I will get to that when I get to that. Right now, I need something to stop me from feeling because there is real shame and real guilt, real fault and remorse. Um, sometimes real suicide for the things that I did. Like, so I couldn't face them. And I remember that night, and that, that 200 bucks didn't get me very far, man. <laughs> it wasn't a good day. Did it go towards your tickets? No. No. I, uh, Athens was, is, is kind of a small town. It's a little bigger now, but it was a small town. And, um, you walk around looking homeless on a five mile stretch of town and where your family's from and your family's going to see you. So, I get a ride. I don't I don't even know how I get back to my grandmother's house. And she had kicked me out. But she let me back in after a few months. And I was living with a whole other story. I was living with some other people. But uh, I remember crying myself to sleep that night. But I couldn't hide it. I couldn't. I couldn't fake it. Everybody that met my face was just like, dude, are you okay? Like, there was no okayness anymore. I could not hide myself. I was absolutely exposed. And I had, and that money didn't get me anywhere. And I had no choice but to feel. And it sucked. If a human could spontaneously combust, that's what it feels like. It's this rock in this hard place where I don't know how to keep doing what I'm doing because I know it's not doing me any good. And I don't know how to stop doing what I'm doing. Like, like, how do I stop in my addiction? I don't know how to stop. And I don't know how to keep going in my addiction. I really didn't even know how I was going to even pick up the next drink. And I had abs I, I lost faith. In that drink, that drug, that thing. I had I lost faith in it making me feel better. And it sucked, man. I cried myself to sleep that night and I said, God, whatever you are, whoever you are, I can't do this anymore. And I need you to help me. I need you. I will never forget the way I prayed that prayer. And I was wailing in a pillow, dude. It was the most shameful thing. <laughs> like, you know, dude, you can let video out of me doing anything in my past, like, and it get out there. And it might suck. And it might be a little embarrassing. Not that. <laughs> that is just between me and God right there. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah. space. That mess. 
that mess that I was, man. Uh, dude, I'll tell you what, man. I it was one of the most beautiful days ever, man. I woke up the next morning, and any smokers out there know, like you wake up and you're gonna smoke a cigarette, at least with a coffee, something, dude. I I didn't touch the pack, the brand new pack of cigarettes that were right there on the side of the bed with a joint rolled up and stuck in the middle of it. So there was one cigarette out of the pack to replace so that I could stick a weed. Anyway, so brand new pack, man. And my meth pipe. All right there. I got up and got dressed because my grandma was like, hey, you have a probation meeting. And I didn't touch any of that stuff, man. I felt something good. I felt something good. I can't, I couldn't have described it at the time, but like it was prevenient grace, man. He was, God was coming. He answered. Like, I know that today, like he, he came and he started pushing stuff almost hastily as if like, like, like God is saying, I've been waiting for you to ask for help. My dude, let me start. I've been planning this out for years now. Thank you for reaching out to me. Sincerely yours, God. You know, and I felt just movement, man. And I went to my probation meeting and uh, this was November 16th, 2016. November 9th, November 9th, 2016. I was reading, I was watching the news while I was waiting and seeing how Trump just won the election. You know? Yeah. And, uh, I remember, I remember where I was. <laughs> yeah. I, remember, I was in school. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah. In and, middle and school. I think, I think I looked it up. I, I guess it must have been like the day after or like the, there was still polling. Anyway, I remember like, oh, Trump won. Cool. Anyway, uh, I get called in and I go and I sit in front of my probation officer. And I say, hey, so I haven't been doing so good with this whole not drinking and drugging thing. And um, I want to transfer to San Antonio. I had that girl on my mind, mind you. Oh, man. But I said, I want to transfer to San Antonio so I can get into sober living. I had been to rehab once at this point. And I remember my counselor was like, all right, the next step is to go to sober living. And I was just like, yeah, dude, whatever. You know, so rehab didn't teach me nothing. But I remembered him saying that. And and all this stuff was coming together. You know, God was always there telling me what the right choice was going to be, what, where the right friends were. But I ignored it. I had the Holy Spirit turned all the way down. And I walked past blessings and miracles every day in my addiction. But I was standing in front of my probation officer feeling sober as a duck. I mean, I was not going to pass a drug test. I'm, unless he drug tested me and I passed because God was doing some stuff, man. <laughs> like, I could have even passed a drug test in that moment, bro. Dude, For real. I mean, I couldn't pass any hearing tests growing <laughs> up. So. Eight hours after passing out from a come down, I'm sitting in front of my probation officer and I feel clean. My mugshot shows different. So right after I tell him, Hey, I want to transfer and get in sober living, man. I, I, some, yes. I don't remember what all I said. But he said, well, we can talk about that after you post bond. And before I could process exactly what he was trying to say to me, I turned around, there's a sheriff standing behind me. Oh, man. Can I tell you, I was never more relieved to be put in handcuffs. As the handcuffs were being placed on me, and I'm processing through the emotions and and I've already pointed at cops before. I've already pointed at all these things. I knew what my problem, I mean doing air quotes again, I knew my problem was alcohol and I started to think, I'm about to go to jail. Three meals in a warm bed <laughs> and no drugs and alcohol around me, hopefully, right? So I was... Usually I'm mad or I'm crying when I'm in handcuffs. Right now, in this moment, I was like peaceful, dude. This was one of the most spirit-filled days of my life to date. 
Let me, I was on probation. So this was a probation revocation, okay? Like, they let me out of jail over a situation. It was actually drugs in a drug-free zone and a weapon in a weapon-free zone. It was a double felony on school grounds. I was on probation for it, dude. <laughs> and I, I, I can't even, I can't even stay clean for two years to save my entire life, right? No, I failed three drug tests and missed a probation office meeting or two in six months. I was a complete failure on probation. The probation officer couldn't even keep me sober, man. So, I'm going to jail. I remember my grandpa took me there, and he was asleep in his expedition in the parking lot. And I remember telling the sheriff, Hey, uh, would you guys, like, go wake up my grandpa and let him know, like, he doesn't need to wait for me <laughs> because I'm not coming out? And they never got him because I remember I, we talked about this a couple of years ago. He was like, no, I woke up and I had to go in there. And I was like, where is he at? <laughs> they didn't even tell him. They let him <laughs> sleep in his car. Anyway, uh, I go to jail. 30 days later, I, I'm standing in front of the judge. And they offer me probation again. I denied probation. And sat in jail for five more months. I did not do that. I... Me, myself, and I would have jumped out of that jail and probably said F probation and drove to San Antonio. And then I would have gotten into trouble again. And again. And again. God stayed in there with me, man. He stayed in it. I remember seeing my, my mom and my aunt in the courthouse, in the courtroom, and they, I remember seeing them start to cry when I said, I'm going to stay in jail. 21 years old, 22. And I'm going to stay in there for six months. God, that What a way to reconnect with God is what I think about every time, man. Like God said, we're going to get you there. But first, you need to get that shit out of your system. Was that night before all that, the night you wept, so right before that, uh -huh. was that the last time? Was that the last time you drank, did any drugs? Dude, I wish. I wish. Um, that was where I, I came to understand that I was not going to do this by myself. That no human power was going to help me at all. I had exhausted every resource that they have available to an addict like me. If I had all the money in the world, I had tried everything that is readily available for an addict like me. There is not a pill to take there's not a class to go through. There's not the right parents. There's not the right school system or, or the right skin color. There's nothing on this planet that can take away my addiction, that can solve this addiction problem. Uh, I remember getting out of jail six months later, and that was the longest I've been sober since I was 14. Whoa, dude. <laughs> you know? And, and you were 21? Uh, when I got out, I was probably about to turn 22. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I wasn't 22 yet. I was 21, and I was done drinking, right? Uh, I like to say I was done drinking before I turned 21, you know, but... Uh, and I really was, man. I really was. Uh, right once you hit that age to be able to drink. Right. Super antisocial. So, uh, I moved to San Antonio, dude. Six months later. Like, that thing that was on my heart the morning after, it happened. I said I had a girl in San Antonio... Um, not really at this point. 
that wasn't really a thing anymore. You know, six months, six months in jail to do that. But uh, I still, you know, we still saw each other. What I got out of moving to San Antonio and moving into sober living, dude, I mean, three days after getting out, like I was packed and I was there. And uh, I got to see community. I got to, I, for years, I had been doing this thing alone. And the first place God takes me is loneliness with him for six months. I did extensive um, Bibling. <laughs> you know, I didn't just read the Bible. I did, I did, but uh, I attended some like classes in jail. Yeah. Um, what was... What was different when when you got when you got to San Antonio? Getting around that community <clears throat> um, made me, for the first time in my life, the first time in my life at twenty one, realize that I was not alone. I got to San Antonio is a big place, and um, I was in an Oxford House, actually. Shameless plug, man. Check out Oxford House. I opened I opened at, at Oxford House here in San Angelo. Yeah. But uh we'll, we can talk about that another time. <laughs> um hundreds. Personally getting to kind of know hundreds of people just like me, dude. People whose stories made me cry. And I was like, man, I thought I was the saddest story. <laughs> you know? Their stories would make me cry, dude. Uh, people who's, who's at, before they're 30, doctors tell them they won't make it to 30, you know, and they're 34, you know, and, and man, that's, ah, dude, it's crazy stuff. I'd be crying. It's, I got to just see living proof, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm on this journey of life with God and God shows me that he was carrying me the whole time. And then when I tell God, like to help me, it's like. It's like this, all right, wake up and realize I was with you the whole time and I'm in jail, which I'm so grateful for it. I realized that God really knew what he was doing. And then God takes me and shows me that I'm not alone and shows me living and, and, and not that just that I'm not alone, but that like he it takes care of everybody. And I got to see living proof of miracles all around me, man. He was carrying you that whole time. That whole time. That whole time, dude. And I'm over here thinking I'm making all my own decisions. And I mean, yes, but like, he's got plans for me, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I was about, I was almost a year sober and I was, I was making it check by check, man. Which was simple living, dude. I didn't have a car this whole time. I enjoyed it. And uh, I got a job opportunity to travel to casinos under leadership to help develop like departments. It was super cool. They were like, it was still going to be contract work at first. And it was going to be crazy, like money as contract. And, and I don't, man, I don't know what happened with this whole like pink cloud of just man wherever God wants me to go but I remember very very clearly how I wasn't where I needed to be in my recovery yet and people around were trying to call that out on me the community that I was with loved me enough to say dude I don't think you should take that job God was using them man right I don't I don't think I don't think it's time yet man are you going for the right reasons what you got to go to meetings there and things like that and uh i took offense to it like i got i started to get back in control of myself you know and so i was like dude all right guys y'all are just jealous right or, or or whatever i don't know i was just like you guys don't know what you're talking about i need to go start doing something with my life like I wasn't doing something with my life compared to where I was a year before that you know 
Uh, so I go and I travel to a few casinos, man. I go to Bossier City, Louisiana and Foxwoods, Connecticut. And then I end up at the Horseshoe Casino in Indiana. And uh, I'm not sober anymore. Voila. Like magic, dude. Let me tell you the crazy story right here. Okay, between between jobs, I would go back to Texas for like a few days before the next location. And the first time I came back, maybe even the second time, I came back and they would let me stay the night in the Oxford house with them. And I was still sober. Like I could just stay the night there. It was a house, it was a bed to sleep on. And my family wasn't really cool with me yet. Okay. So I had a place to stay and that was cool. And the last time I was still sober. I had just gotten like 14 months. And I'm like, hey, do you guys think I could like, you know, stay the night? Uh, here, can I couch? We call it couching. Can I couch until, um, you know, tomorrow so I can wash clothes and stuff? And they told me no. They told me no. And there were different people living there at the time. Like, it changes. And uh, I got a feeling that I didn't know how to process. And I still am not sure what it was. The selfishness, probably. <laughs> but like, I was just like, man, I was uncomfortable. And I started texting somebody who I knew wasn't sober anymore. I was like, hey, dude, I know you. I, I, I remember you just got an apartment. Like, I, They're not letting me stay here. Can I stay over there? And God even still continued to warn me. This dude was like, hey, uh, I'm not sober, man. I don't. I don't know if you might want to come over here. That was a warning. And I said, no, dude, it's cool. I just really need to do laundry. I didn't get any laundry done. Um, get this, okay? So I go on this three-day bender, again, filling myself with the things of the world. Come on, Siri. You Siri. gotta interrupt us like that. I'm filling myself up with what's in the world, and I remember uh, passing out, and I didn't sleep for like three days, dude. Like when I finally get sleep, I wake up to a phone call from my boss, and he's offering me a permanent position in Indiana with this big pay raise and wow your sobriety and your work has paid off and he says we need you to come in and take a drug test <laughs> is that not Man. god dude that is that is crazy i don't take a drug test for 14 months and within three days of picking back up my addiction a drug test lies before me. Timing, man. It timing. was not my timing. We call it in, in recovery. We call it the like the horde, the hideous four horsemen: terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And it is like the Walking Dead, and not the not the series, the Walking Dead, but like. I was walking and I felt empty. I felt empty because I can tell you right now, the spirit was all over those decisions. But once I made it, I made my decision. I made my decision. And you, it's, you were making the decision for him. You weren't listening. That's, yeah. I, you know, and it's not, truth is, you know, that whole time, he still is going. Yeah. He still is trying to speak with me. The only thing is, I am in control of the volume knob. And I muted it, man. I was like, nope, I need to do laundry. <laughs> and the truth was, man, I needed to fill this hole. I started to feel shaky. And instead of turning to God, I, I didn't have faith that that he would solve that problem for me, you know? And times are going to get difficult where we don't feel like 
God can actually do something about this situation when he very well so can. Definitely would have done better than I did. Okay, because I picked up and I took a drug test and I drank so much water trying to pass that drug test that they made me go in and take a second drug test because it was diluted. And by the time I took the second drug test, I passed. Yeah. And did that help me at all? No. No. You gave me the confidence to do things the way I decided to do them, you know? And and it was full sale from there. I don't know how I made it 11 months as a project manager for a casino, but I lost my job horribly. I got into horrible accidents on the, along the way. I hurt. I don't know how many people, and I lied every breath for that year. I've been sober for, oh, four years and three months. And that's not a lot of time. It's not a lot of time. Um, it sure felt like a lot of time at day one. And thinking of day two felt so much larger. And I do believe that all the time that is in front of you looks a lot bigger than the time behind you. Because I feel like these four years have just flown by. Uh, <clears throat> I think what was different now, see, when I got out of jail and went to San Antonio, I had ideas. I had these ideas. I was going to get this girl back. And I was going to get a good job. And I was going to get my life back together. Even under, like... Even preaching what God has done for me and my life and getting me sober, there were still these underlying personal decisions that I had for my life. Well, to, to the last day of my addiction, I was back at the same spot as I'd been before. I burnt all the bridges and I didn't know how to keep drinking and I didn't know how to stop drinking. I could spontaneously combust, okay? One thing I did figure out about that rock in that hard place is people are very vulnerable in those situations. I am very, I was very vulnerable every time I hit those, those bottoms. Where if, if you had put a gun in my hand in those moments, I probably would have shot myself. Like, I literally did not know how, which is if you really think about it, that is, that is a lot. To not know how to keep drinking, you pick it up and you keep drinking. I, I malfunctioned. It's like an error code, man. I can't even think about what you just told me. Keep, pick it up and keep drinking. Like I can't keep drinking and then I can't stop drinking. The error code, man. And I was going to take anything. So you could have handed me Buddha. I probably would have tried it. Could have handed me a gun. Probably would have shot myself. But by the grace of God, God was there every time. He did not miss those moments with me. Uh, this time was at my grandmother's house through... I, I only can describe it as she took a mirror and she placed it in front of her to face me. And she just gave me a good look at myself when I was in that rock in that hard place. And what I got from this last time, man, was you don't know anything. Romans 7.25 For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not know what I want, and I do the very thing I hate. That was actually verse 14. <laughs> For eight, okay, verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. You know, and this verse first spoke to me through uh, a book called Winning the War in Your Mind. That's the first time that that verse was used in an effort to, to distinguish our human willpower. We grew up in a society where people tell you, you can do whatever you want and be whoever you want to be as long as you put enough willpower into it, as long as you work hard enough. When for thousands of years, people have been saying, 
get God in your life and figure out what you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do with your life. Mm -hmm. We have shifted far from it. That's why addiction is so rampant. And in Texas, where it's pick yourself up by your bootstraps and get it done. Like, I had a problem. I had to fix it. And I'm not going to blame that for being what kept me out so long. But that is an understanding that I have today. That is what that is the way I thought about how I'm supposed to be somebody. Is I got to be the person. It just doesn't make sense. Spiritual things don't make sense. Well, there was that, there was that whole... Throughout your life, there's that one hole that you're trying to fill. Mm. But it, it's it's not a square that can go to a circle hole. The whole time you're trying to fit a square into a circle hole. No, it's a God-shaped hole it that God. only God can be in. It's a God-sized hole, man. And I never described it like that until three years ago, four years ago. Uh, December 29th, 2018. That mirror was in front of me when I was at my exploding point. And what I saw was, you don't know anything. And I just threw my hands up in the air. And I didn't have an idea. I had no more ideas. I am not from San Angelo. Nor have I ever been through San Angelo. Nor did I know San Angelo was a town. (laughs) Until in Athens, Texas, I pick up the phone and I call who was my spiritual leader from San Antonio, who I didn't make contact with my entire time in addiction that when I relapsed. And uh, I said, hey, I need a place to go. Because I I really did. I needed a place to go. Um, that was my last idea. And then I let everything... I let, I let God and, and people that were there for me take me the rest of the way (laughs) he was like i'm in san angelo anyway he says come tomorrow we'll do an interview so i get packed and move which packed i had like a backpack man i didn't have (laughs) i didn't have nothing dude all the clothes that i had i stole from somebody when i moved to san angelo i did not own anything but i had some really gracious parents I have some very good loving parents who gave me some clothes and a cell phone and they paid like my first deposit at the home because it's not free sober living. Sober living ain't free. And man, it all is, it all goes up from there. Uh, This time was different because if you, I was absolutely hopeless in what it was going to take for me to stay sober for the rest of my life. And I still am hopeless when it comes to me telling you that I'm going to stay sober for the rest of my life. You ever say, I'm going to do the laundry tomorrow. I'll wash the dishes tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) I said, for years, I said, I'm going to get sober tomorrow. Or I'm going to do something different tomorrow. Tomorrow never came. You know why? Why? Tomorrow does not exist. You can't actually put something into tomorrow. Tomorrow only evolves into today. Mm -hmm. It will always be today. That's why you have all these cliches and and, uh, recovery like 24 hours a day, one day at a time. Keep it simple. I lit like those are a part of my makeup today. Like it's coded in me to understand and it's all biblical. It's all biblical. Uh, what I just read, um, Romans seven eighteen, is the first step. I can't. The next step is that God can. And though I got to like kind of grasp some of those understandings when I was in San Antonio, I would mix them with my own ideas and come to my own conclusions about the limitations of those truths. But coming to San Angelo, if you told me to pull my pants down and poop in the corner, if I want to stay sober today... I would have done it <laughs> because I had no idea, dude, what I was going to have to do, man. Dude, no toilet paper? I didn't ask. I wouldn't ask. <laughs> I wouldn't ask because that would be assuming that that is what I need. <laughs> like, oh for real, God. dude, uh, you know, my sobriety today is full of um, 
great things, man. I get to, we're in the school of ministry and uh, I'm married. I've held a job for the longest I've ever had, like two and a half years. You know, I've mm-hmm. never, and I'm awesome. still experiencing firsts. Like, get it. I Maybe I've done something a hundred times, but I've never done it sober. And it's like doing it for the first time sober. That's awesome. So where where are you at now? In what ways? Where in in your spiritual life? Mm. In your sober life now? Your married life? Where are you at? Where is God in all of this? We've gotten to where he's in it like every day. Uh because it's one day at a time, right? And so, you know, it it's taken a while, but it, I had to de- help. I needed help to develop how today God is going to be the first and foremost priority in my life. And um, so now, Mondays, school ministry. Tuesdays, might be doing this podcast. Uh, hopefully, we're going to be bringing God into it, you know, regularly on Tuesdays. But, you know, if not, I'll go I'll go get God. Uh, but Wednesdays, marriage group. Trying to take our marriage to a biblical level. Thursdays is young adults. And this Thursday, I've been asked to speak in a panel. It's going to be like a little Q&A. And I'm going to be saying a lot of the stuff that I said today. And I think it's super cool because they didn't ask me to come on this panel because I'm a recovered drug addict. They asked me to be on this panel because they love they they know that I put Christ to a high level in my life mm-hmm. like I mean I, I can't really say that they love the way I walk with God but I mean I've heard them say that you know and it blows my mind because I didn't do anything if you ask me how I got sober like I didn't do that I got out of the way. I submitted. I surrendered. I threw in the towel and gave up the way I think things need to go. I'm not, I wasn't in charge. I'm just merely following directions today. You know, and my life has never um, been so full. See, I found out that God is a sufficient substitute for whatever I think needs to go in that God-sized hole. Because if I get, if I put God there, then I'm okay with you, and I'm okay with me, and I'm not worried about tomorrow, and I'm not worried about yesterday, and my skin fits just right. Amen. That's great. Well, guys, uh, thank y'all for coming, and uh, you know I want us to I want us to leave on prayer. So, uh, Trent, would you pray us out, please? Okay, yeah. I'd like to take a moment of silence for those who aren't going to wake up tomorrow in the middle of their addiction. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, providing an opportunity to, to record the things that you have done on this earth to to reach others thank you for community thank you for accountability thank you for friendships thank you for never ever having left and in those times where I felt most alone thank you for carrying me thank you for putting me through things that I needed to go through and for allowing me to live through things that I did not need to go through. I pray that all of those listening and uh, all those who are going to be listening um, maybe years from now that that they can get a little glimpse, just a little glimpse of hope that whatever they're stuck in it it doesn't have to be permanent. God, thank you for being simple. Thank you for loving us every day. 
Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, whose death, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement gives us this intercession with you. Uh, and that's all you ever had to do. We didn't even deserve that. And if that's the only thing that you ever did for us, God, that would have been just more than enough. And we still wouldn't have deserved it. But God, you continue, you continue to intercede. And I just thank you. I pray for those who are hesitating to reach out to somebody they might know who's struggling with addiction. And I pray that um, they have the confidence to reach out, but not on their own power, but on yours, God, your loving, gracious, merciful hand. Pray all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I what I might have been like, yes, sir. Detected at the front door. Uh. <laughs> Sorry, guys. You'll just have to cut that part out. Yeah. It's not a good part.